Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day one of Building High Impact Nonprofits of Color, an open training series. We are going to give people about 30 more seconds to get more people in the room before we get started. But in the meantime, just sit back and relax. Okay, so we've given people about another minute to log on. I'm sure that the attendees list is going to continue to expand as we move forward. But again, thank you for registering to attend this event. This is day one of building high impact nonprofits of color and open training series. And today's topic will be effective communication strategies rooted in equity. My name is Olivia Harp and I am the program manager for network building. I'm just here to get you all settled as we jump into today's learning opportunity. So just a few housekeeping um, guidelines. We will be recording this webinar and it will be mailed out to you as well as any other registrants that may have missed out on this um, live event. All of you are muted to ensure sound quality, but please, please, please talk to us in the questions box um, and you can type that in the GoToWebinar panel. If you experience any technical issues, please email us at gotomeeting at prosperitynow.org. So just getting the most out of today's call, we know it is an early morning for those on the East Coast and even earlier morning for those of you on the West Coast. So we just wanna encourage you to just get cozy, um, join from a quiet place, grab a coffee or a snack or even breakfast. I know I have my coffee right next to me engage us. So again, use that questions box to send us comments and questions so that we can react to you in real time. And everything that we do here at Prosperity Now, we want to ensure that it's applicable. So always reflect on ways to apply what you learned today to your own work and feel free to use that questions box um, to brainstorm with us as well. So Prosperity Now's mission is to ensure everyone in our country has a clear path to financial stability, wealth, and prosperity. And today's agenda, we've already done the welcome and the housekeeping. You're going to hear a little bit about the background and history of building high impact nonprofits of color. Um, then we'll jump straight into the content and you'll get those communication strategies, tools, and we'll talk about storytelling, and next, we will have a great group discussion and Q&A. So get, um, get acquainted with that questions box so that you can interact with Mark as much as possible. And then we'll do a next steps and close. So um, talk about ways that you can apply what you've learned today or even interact with more um, action items at Prosperity Now. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Ebony White. She is the Senior Director of Programs here at Prosperity Now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, um, I just also want to take the time to thank you all for joining us for today's session on communication. Um, as Olivia mentioned, my name is Ebony White, Senior and Director of Programs here at Prosperity Now. And I just want to tell you a little bit around the Building High Impact Nonprofits of Color project and how it's connected to our mission at Prosperity Now. Next slide, please. So at Prosperity Now, we really try to create opportunities to create, identify, test, and amplify new and existing, existing systems-oriented solutions. And we do that by centering those who have been historically and systemically marginalized. We partner with local um, nonprofits on the ground, including some advocates and um, some local um, government folks. But in particular, we really, really try to connect with um, nonprofits that are black and brown led, that are serving communities of color, low income communities. We find ways to use our platform to lift up um, promising solutions that's really um, centering those who we um, are really trying to provide opportunities to. We incubate, evaluate, amplify, and share. And so 
With today's um, training around communication, this is an opportunity for us to be able to lift up those promising practices, promising act, um, practices as well as finding ways to help you understand how to better influence the different key stakeholders that are really um, connected to the work that you all are doing respectively. And uh, through all this work, we're hoping to be able to help to advance policy and narrative change in a way that's really creating a system that everyone has the opportunity to be able to have the economic mobility and the thrive that they are looking for. And so with the Building High Impact Nonprofits of Color project, not, next slide, please. This project is something that we have been doing since 2016, and this initiative has allowed us to provide access to resources and um, partnerships for nonprofits that are black and brown led, working to advance economic wealth building strategies for communities of color. We would not be able to do the work we do without our great partners and funders. And for this particular project, I do want to thank Capital One for their investment and giving us the opportunity to bring these resources to um, nonprofits. This particular um, cohort is, is centered in the DMV. So um, that is um, the District of Columbia, Maryland, and Virginia, for those who are not familiar with that term. And it really allowed us to provide some leadership development, some technical assistance to help strengthen their organizational infrastructure and the effectiveness of, of how they're working to really look at things through a cultural lens and to also um, understand some of the, the um, barriers and limitations that nonprofits um, that are BIPOC-led may typically deal with because they are typically small to medium sized. And so Communications is one of the um, curriculum topics that we brought to the uh, organization. And one of the things that Capital One was really clear about was, was that while we had a cohort of organizations that we were working with, we really wanted to also provide some opportunities for other nonprofits to be able to gather and um, be able to um, get some of the same resources that they had. And so this is our opportunity to really be able to um, expose other nonprofits to the great um, material and best practices that our expert leaders have brought to the cohort. So with that, I'm going to um, transition us to Mark Desser, who is from Spitfire Communications, and he will really um, allow us to be able to hear some of the best practices around what does it mean when we're talking about low-income communities of color? What does it mean to influence your target um, stakeholders? And what does it mean for you to get the action that you're looking for to be able to advance the work that you're doing? And Mark has been with us since the beginning of 2016. So I definitely have um, much um, you know, um, passion and love for him because he has definitely been on this journey with us um, since we started this back in 2016. So thank you, Mark. Thank you so much, Ebony. I really appreciate that. Uh, welcome. Uh, thanks so much for all of you uh, for being here. We're going to try to make the most out of the next one hour and 50 minutes and talk about strategic communications and the work that you're doing. And because basically we use communications for everything. If we want policy change, if we want behavior change, we need fundraising, communications is at the heart of it. And understanding the narratives we're working within, and if we're deficit framing or asset framing, all of these things we're gonna talk about, as well as giving you some messaging tools and some storytelling guidance. So with that, let's dive in. All right, next slide. Uh, these might be some of the goals here to understand strategic communications, introduce smart chart, but go ahead and move it. Uh, I've got to build on this slide. What I'm really looking for right here and what I'd love from all of you is that light bulb moment. This is something that happened for me when I went through a communication training and I saw, oh, you know what? I don't have to have something that goes viral. I don't need to have a communication plan just to communicate. The real goal of communications, and this was my light bulb moment, is to support your overall organization's uh, objectives and your strategy. And a lot of times, if you're responsible for communications, 
you're like, oh man, I've got to get this. And then there's a lot of executive directors out there. Some of you might be on this call who really want that front page headline, want a podcast, want to get that totally viral TikTok. And it's fine and that's great. But the issue is that is your audience on TikTok. And if they are, go forward. We want to focus on audience-centered communications. And so we'll go through that. And Olivia, next slide, please. So light bulb moments, we're going to go through that. We're going to talk about communications, uh, how to use the smart chart there. We'll walk briefly through the smart chart, go to your audience and messaging, and then we'll get down to ethical and strategic storytelling. So that's our ambitious agenda, and we've got some fun along the way. What I love about what building high-impact nonprofits of color and what Prosperity Now has done for the different cohorts and for all of you right here for this uh, training program, is it's more than just comms or a webinar. These things all fit together. So as you go through all of these trainings, you're gonna hear some really great support from leadership, strategy, development, as I said, communications ties it together. And we'll go to the next slide. I wanna start off with a story. Um, I was the head of communications for a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation program for about 10 years. We were based in North Carolina. I'm here in Durham, yay, for any other North Carolinians uh, that are on board. Um, and we, I was helping out with comms, helping the grantees we supported, which were 75 across the country and a bunch across North Carolina. Um, Julie Jackman, was one of them. She ran a program called Working Toward Wellness. It was in Charlotte, North Carolina. It was kind of a cool program. And her goal was to really approach a healthier work site to get people healthier. Healthier food offered, using stairs, uh, more flex time for you to be active, all those things. And she had success in her first year, but um, she wanted more. So she called me and she said, hey, Mark, uh, I really want to get this program out. I've had a success with these like three companies. I need to go big. Can you get me on the morning news? And I said, sure, I, no problem. Which day, what channel, what time do you want to be on? She was kind of taken back. She's like, what do you mean? And I said, well, you'll be on one of those, but who, who's going to be watching it at that time? Who's your main audience? And she said, well, it's the CEOs. And I said, so the CEOs find out about you and they bring you on board? She said, actually, it's the head of HR. Great. So I asked this, um, does the, do all the HR directors in Charlotte have an organization which they belong to, connect with, share information? She said, yes. Do they have a newsletter or e-newsletter that you could put information about your program in? Yes. Do they have an annual meeting that you could present to about your program? Yes. Would it be better if it's coming from you or from one of the HR directors that you helped? Boom, light bulb goes off. One of those light bulb moments, she co-presents with one of the HR directors, sends out information to their newsletter, all these things happen, and in the end, she gets 16 companies signing up in that next year. And it was so successful, and Olivia, go ahead, hit the forward. There, it's a kind of a slow, adjust. We'll see it. It was so successful. I know the suspense is killing y'all. You can hit it one more time. That she was invited on the morning news. It was a Thursday, CBS, and you can see it was 649 in the morning. The point is, sometimes we chase those viral things. We chase the news, the flashy, but we don't have our story there yet. We're trying to promote something and it's not really news. The news and the things that people get excited about is when you've done the work and then get that attention and then get more funding and more funders involved and engaged to see what you're doing. So that's my little story on strategy. Next slide, please. Before we go into the smart chart, this is the really cool tool that all the building high impact nonprofits of color have gone through. We spent an entire day going through this. This is a communication planning tool. Kristen Grimm started Spitfire Strategies. 
in 2001. Uh, she did it to basically say, here's the free recipe, how to communicate more effectively. And we've been focusing on nonprofits and foundations for now 22 years. Next slide, we've updated it. It's now SmartChart 4.0. Uh, and this is something which you can see on the worksheets that you have, the handouts. This is the type of worksheet that you can fill out. You can look at it while we're doing this, but I would recommend you do this on your own. We also have it online. So this is like a Google Doc. Uh, you can sign up. It is smartchart.org, and you can share your smart chart and communications plan with other team members, get their input, and have a very powerful uh, comm plan. So let's walk through it and learn more. But before we go through the smart chart, let's talk about laws of communication. Law number one, perception versus fact. It's something that we in nonprofits often lead with our one pagers, um, some facts, some data points, all these things to change minds. We wanna win the hearts and minds of our community members, of funders, of everybody. But the problem is what's more powerful? perception or facts. So I have a quiz for you in the next slide. Here's another little story. Next slide, please. And go ahead. Uh, well, we'll launch the poll questions in just a second. There is uh, the Petrified Wood uh, National Park in Arizona. Really cool park. I've never been there. Um, I don't know if any of you have been there, but it's a former forest and it's all made out of stone really cool, big problem. People go to the park and they're like, this is a million years old. I'm going to take it home as a paperweight. And so they put up signs there that said collecting petrified wood is prohibited. It didn't really work. So they said, let's test out some signs and see what it is. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to give you three signs here. And here's these poll questions. So go ahead. There's one. One sign said stealing these ancient rocks is a felony can result in a fine and criminal record. Sign number two, so many people take these rocks that the park could disappear in a decade. Please do not steal these rocks. And sign number three, some people say that they are cursed after taking these rocks and they send them back. Please don't take the rocks. So I'm gonna ask all of you in that poll, was it sign one, sign two, or sign three? Which one would you say? Just drop it in the, in the chat. Which one worked best? They all kind of worked, but one really worked. Which one would work on you? We have sign three as the number one response um, with sign two trailing behind and sign one in last place right now, Mark. Awesome. What What's the, the, the numbers on there? Who has the most? I signed three, but by far. All right. Y'all are super smart and brilliant communicators. Yes. It was sign three. Go ahead. Hit the uh, advance the slide a little bit, Olivia. Um, one more time. These are letters that they put up. How many of you believe in curses? Raise your hand. How many of you don't want to test out the curse? You don't believe in them, but you don't want to test out the curse. Look, this mainly goes to show that even though we try to deal in a world of facts, the people we communicate with ourselves, we're emotional, irrational human beings. Curses work. Signs about curses work. And if you read that letter on the left, holy cow, I'm not going to take a rock. So this is something important to know about communications. We need to deal with people's emotions and lived experience. Next slide. Thank you for picking slide number three there. Y'all are brilliant. You're actually one of the few groups that have done that. I am genuinely impressed. Uh, the second thing that's really important about communications is repetition and consistency. The second thing 
to know about communications is repetition and consistency. There, w there's a study that shows that for the average person, they have to hear something 11 times before it fully sinks in. So when you think about all of those uh, election ads, and it's the same thing over and over, they're trying to break through. So how many of you, you this is just an answer on your own, go through your messaging or your, you know, how you say, and you're like, oh, we need to change it up. We're tired of it. Listen, when you change up your messaging, your audience might be hearing it for the first time. So keep your messaging. Use it over and over. Be consistent about it. Very important. It'll break through. By the way, that study did not show it takes my kids, they need to hear something 31 times before it sinks in with a threat of not getting something. Next slide, please. Prioritize audience. We can't engage everybody. In fact, there's no general public. We can't go after that. Well, we want to focus on the people who can make a difference. And we like to change language. Priority audience instead of target audience. Target is language which is based in violence. Uh, and this is something we want to move to our priority audience, who we care about, who we want to engage. Focus on them. People can move. Next slide. And the last law of communication is that your communication should be rooted in equity and understanding that there are visible and invisible structures in our society, which either privilege groups or oppress groups. And if you're trying to communicate with a group that is dealing with one of these many barriers that are out there and your communication does not address it, does not mention it, you might be missing the boat and not able to connect with the audiences you need to. So make sure it is rooted in equity. Understand the political and the power structures that are in place that are either privileging or oppressing different people. All right, thank you. Next slide. Let's get into the smart chart. All right, here we go. Uh, in the smart chart, we ask you to start with strategy. With most communication plans, what do you do? You think all right, we need to get this report out or we need to start a campaign. Let's get something in the newspaper. Let's hold an event, put it on social media and go. And then you do break down the timeline. We get to that in box four down there. But we're gonna start with strategy. This is why the smart chart is different. Next slide, please. And we want you to put some strategic object objectives out there that you're gonna build a communications plan on. And so first build on here, go ahead, Olivia. A lot of folks come through and say, hey, for communications, we want to increase our newsletter open rate. We wanna raise awareness from the general public. Eh, don't say that. We want more social media followers, more media coverage. And what at Spitfire we always, always ask, next build, is to what end? Next build, please. Why do you want to get that newsletter open rate? It's not enough just to get the open or the media coverage. It should bring something for your organization. It should bring more funders in, sign up more volunteers. You, the more you focus your communications on a priority audience, the more successful you'll be. The wider it is, the fewer success or least success you'll have. Next slide. All right. We want it to be a smart objective that you're putting into the smart chart. This is your comms plan. We're walking through this right now. You want it to be specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. In fact, we want to go beyond smart. Next build. And make it smart E. Ensure it's inclusive and equitable. And when you are building your objective, this is not your communication objective, this is your objective that you need to accomplish for your organization, we'll build the comms plan to get that objective done. And so we need to be as specific as possible. Who are we gonna be engaging? By what percent or number of people or number of dollars we wanna increase? Attainable, is this something that your organization can do? Do you have enough staff, time, budget, all of that to do that? Realistic, is this something that 
can happen right now in your community right now? Is this something that people are ready to listen to, act upon, or is there a flood going on or a strike going on or something else that's taking people's attention and their funds? Time bound. We used to say 12 to 16 months, um, but it is, um, we, because of COVID and everything else, the world changes in two or three months. So we like to say between eight and 10 months, inclusive, meaning if you're going to be talking about and working on a specific audience, they should be part of the conversation. You should be working with them, not on them. And equitable, as mentioned before, understanding uh, what the power structures are and how they're oppressing and how does your smart chart align with that. Next slide, please. So all of you will be doing it for, here's our larger goal. We want to end health disparities in the city, but we've got to get down to an objective. That might be the goal for your organization. So what does that mean? Okay, you might work in the policy area, behavior change area, or fundraising area. And so you want a very smart objective, and you can see down there, pass a city ordinance in two years that prevents the closure to major hospitals that communities of color and, low, and people living in low incomes rely on. Or training 33% in the next 12 months of county healthcare staff. All of these things are smart objectives that you build the comps plan for. Next slide, please. And once you have your objective in there, then who's the decision maker? Who's the person that says, yes, here's the funding, or no, no funding, no partnership, no policy? Understanding that is key. Let's, next slide, please. Let's build this. Like I said, who has the power to, for you to achieve your objective? Keep going, next slide. We often say, it's a decision, it's a funder. What do we mean by funders? The way you might talk and do a communication plan and messaging for a national funder versus a community funder versus a corporate funder, uh, let's say a local bank, versus a high value, uh, high worth individual, uh, that's ready to donate and support you versus uh, community members who might chip in $10 a month or $5 a month. Your messaging is going to be very different. So we want you to be more specific instead of just saying funder. Next slide, please. All right, little quiz right here. If you wanted to get a, you have, you work with a coffee uh, group in uh, Guatemala and in indigenous women are the ones that are running this and it is shade grown coffee and they're growing it and you want to bring it into the market here and get uh, it sold in the United States. Who's the final decision maker to make this happen? Is it the coffee shop owner? Is it the coffee loving population is going to drink it? Is it the CEO? of the coffee company? You can answer it in, in the box, but I'll give you a, I'll, I'll cut to the chase here. And we'll go through this a little bit later. It's the CEO, they have the final say, yes, we're gonna do this or no. If you remember my other uh, example story about worksite wellness, it's the HR director that brings it in but the CEO is the one that makes the final decision on it. But other groups will bring it in. We'll talk about that difference of audiences and decision maker. But for this, you need to know who the final decision maker is, CEO. Next slide, please. Okay, once you have that, we do a little SWOT analysis in the smart chart to understand what's going on within your community. So, next slide. Understand what's happening in your organization. You do internal check. This is all for that objective, not in general, but you can fill this out in the smart chart, get people's input. Do we have enough money, staff time? Do we have lived experience on this issue? Do we have spokespersons that are able to talk about this? What's our reputation? Do we have trust in the community or do we not? 
Where do you have advantages and where do you have challenges? And then you look externally. Now that's good, Olivia. You're, you're good timing there. I love it. Um, what's happening in the world that you can't control but impacts your objective? Is it a hot topic right now or is it off the radar from uh, decision makers? Uh, are there other things taking attention and funding? Are there systemic barriers to this actually happening? Do you have opposition? What are the trend, what's trending that's adjacent to your issue that you could piggyback on? So again, this is important to note because you'll use this to build your comp plan. Next slide, please. And as you do this, you want to position not just your organization, but what you're talking about within the community. You need to understand how do people think about what you're doing and what your objective is. Because understanding where you are in that makes a big difference. Next slide. Are you talking about something for the first time? You're introducing something new. Are you fortifying and amplifying it or are you shifting it? Next slide, we'll talk about the first one, introducing. That's when there is a new concept, something you need to get people's attention on. They don't know about it. If we're talking about, uh, let's say, uh, unequal funding for schools, we've known that for a long time. And we need to change the funding for schools based on our property tax. We need a better, we've known that, so you're not introducing something. But what the NAACP and the ACLU did was actually recognize something that was trending, happening. We were seeing more black youth, specifically boys, that were being uh, punished, suspended, expelled for behavior from kindergarten on in the schools. And this was leading to detention, uh, juvenile um, delinquency that's there, and eventually, um, the prison system. And so they introduced the concept of school to prison pipeline. And they gave it words which people could visualize in their heads. And so when you introduce, you need that for your issue. Many of you might be in the next one. Next one, please. And that is fortify and amplify. We know this is an issue. In fact, we, we can't stop talking about affordable housing. It, we're not solving it. There's no good solution out there, but we need to have this. And so we need to turn up the volume, have this at the center. So many of you are working on something that people know about. You just need to turn up the volume. And the last one, and we'll show a video for this, is about shifting and understanding. So I don't know how many of you uh, have watched the Paralympics or aware of it, and I don't know what your perception is of that. But if you need to shift someone's perception, you do something with public enemy. Video, please. I can act it out as it goes. Well, we can come back to that and we can send that link. Maybe you can drop the link for the video into the chat for people to see. Um, this is, are folks able to see it? It's showing thing it can't be seen on my screen. Just double checking, Olivia. All right, slight tech hiccup here. We can move on if it becomes available. It is basically turning the video and the concept of Paralympics where you're seeing people who are disabled competing after the Olympics, which was seen as charity or something that was, oh, uh, that's nice for them, to actually these are the superhumans. You thought you knew what real strength was, but what they've had to overcome and how they're competing is actually stronger than many Olympians and their work. So it was done uh, in England 
uh, along when they held the Olympics, I think it was in 2012, in uh, London. And they had this incredible, it's a great video with ESPN style uh, edits and visuals and public enemy uh, on the soundtrack and was really cool. We'll send you a link to that so you can see it at home. All right, those are, you wanna know where to shift your audience because you've gotta understand their framework and how you're framing the issue. So frames are away, mental shortcuts. When we say something uh, about founding fathers or American dream, it's a shortcut for something. It ties in the narratives and all of that. But we need to examine those shortcuts. What are we saying and whose language is it? So next slide, please. We're going to talk about asset and deficit framing. And make sure that you check the language, how you talk about things, uh, to make sure you're not reinforcing damaging narratives there. And understanding if you're working with population that are returning citizens from the justice system, they're not, you're not calling them felons, ex-felon, ex-con, former inmate. That was a sentence that they served. It did not define their life. They're actually a person, a mother, a father, a brother, an athlete, an artist who completed a sentence. Allow them to define their lives. We'll talk more about that in messaging and in storytelling. But this all comes from, next slide, please. And go ahead with the build. One more. Trabian Shorters and came up with asset framing. And we have to understand that we want to talk about people and their aspirations and their dreams and their possibilities instead of we often use language from funders, from grant makers that is deficit framing or deficit shaming. And it deals with the challenges in the community that may be caused by structural racism but they, or 400 years of racism, and they are lumped on that population instead of looking at the structures around them. So you have language like this that comes from a funder uh, for a grant program. We provide youth with jobs in order to prevent them from committing crimes. You're calling them future criminals. Instead, next, do the build, please. Say youth in our community are our future. We must invest in them as leaders. So oftentimes, foundations try to solve problems, but they see it a certain way. And nonprofits take that language as they apply for the grant and use that language. We're asking here through the Smart Chart Check It, work on asset framing, play to people's and community strengths, not their challenges that are ascribed to them. Next slide, please. Okay, we've gone through the strategic part in understanding what your objective is, who's the decision maker. Then we have looked at your entire uh, organization. Can you do this? And how are you framing this issue? Where is it in the minds of the audience? Now we get to the messaging part. Next slide, please. Talk about audiences. Some of you said, wait a second. Is that the decision maker? Audiences, what do we mean? Next slide. Here's what we mean. Your decision maker, if you can call them up and say, okay, Michelle Obama, I really need you to talk about this, mention this, do all this. And she's like, sure, no problem, Mark. I'll do it. Then your decision maker is your audience. But I don't have her number and she would not listen to me or anything on that. But maybe you know somebody who knows this person. Maybe there are other influencers on there. These are the audiences you need to engage because you might not be the right messenger. And these are the audiences that that decision maker trusts. So those are the ones that you're gonna work with. Next slide, please. So as we talked about here, the CEO, if, you, if you're running this coffee company out of Guatemala, Shade Grown, uh, and indigenous women are running it, um, the CEO, it's not on their radar. They're not seeing it. But if you start a campaign that engages the population out there, he says, guess what? 
do you want to actually empower women and save the environment with every cup of coffee you drink? Start buying coffee from this company. And this is how we do that. And you say this is available out there and allowing to, those this coffee loving population who wants to change the world with it, they're going to start asking for it from their local coffee company. Say like, hey, can you carry this? This is really good. The coffee shop owner's like, okay, I'm seeing a lot of demand here. Um, can we go up and talk to the CEO? CEO, can you can we start carrying this as one thing? And so it goes to the CEO. That's the assists you need in this game of communications. And so this is what the smart chart helps you do. It works on the messaging. Next slide, please. You need to know whether the decision maker or whether it is the audience that you're engaging here. Not just their demographics, but their psychographics. What do we mean by that? What are the values that they care about? What moves people? Um, what are their barriers that are keeping them from acting? Uh, and so we did this work um, with the Blank Foundation in uh, Atlanta. And their goal was to increase uh, physical activity of middle school girls in the Atlanta region. And so we did a lot of focus groups and we came up with this psychographic uh, pictures of these different elements. We could sort it there and then would do different messaging and different programs for those instead of, hey, middle school girls, it's cool to be active. Sweating is fun. That doesn't work when you try to reach everybody. So understanding it and narrowing it down and understanding their values and barriers is key. Next slide, please. So getting this, understanding their values and barriers, you need to know, again, where your audience is. You understand where the issue is in there, but are you sharing knowledge for the first time? Is this audience that you're trying to engage, getting them to act, is this something that they feel personally connected to? Is this aligned with their values? Is this something that they feel, oh, is really important, I should act upon it? If that's the case, then your messaging is going to be very much like, hey, did you know this is a problem? hey, did you know this is an opportunity? We need to act upon this now. And so you're bringing up, maybe this is where you bring in an important data point or stat and say, hey, this is key. We need to act. Or are you building will? And that is understanding, and this, this is our ladder of engagement. You want to get people who care about it, then you need to get them to act. And it might be simply signing a petition. It might be showing up for a meeting. It might be putting on and wearing some of your, your swag from your organization. If they put on a t-shirt with your name on it, I think you have a fan there. So you make sure that the reward is bigger than the risk. You say, hey, let's go to DC this weekend and I need you all to march for this large thing. Some people will not do that unless there is a larger movement that's there. So know what their barriers are, understand where the comfort zone is, and start with those small asks. And once they see how great your organization is, then you move them to reinforcing action. If they're donating, if they're volunteering, if they're helping advocate on your behalf, thank them. And this is an important thing for all development officers that are out there. Thank them for being a part. Every win that you have as an organization, they are a part of that win. Allow them to feel that win too. And so it's important to thank them, convey that win, showcase your results without asking for money. So the key thing is just thank you. We won this huge court case, all these things, thanks to you. All right, we're playing into, and this is the most important part, what you need for messaging. You need to understand their core values and their concerns. What are the values they care about? And we often think about, we have these big, huge values. Everybody's gonna step up for truth, justice, all of these things. But the reality is many people act on smaller values. I believe in those things, but what do they act upon? And one example, just from my life, 
as I worked on healthy eating and healthy communities and physical activity for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for 10 years. And I'm like, oh, I'm, you know, no fast food, none of that. I'm going to do that. You know what? When I'm taking my kids back from soccer practice and they've got to do homework and I don't have time to cook, I'm stopping at cookout because it's really good and it's cheap and there are milkshakes with bananas. It's all fresh. So there's some health in there, right? Put a banana in milkshake, it's fresh, it's healthy. The point is convenience is and cost is what I act upon. I care about healthy food and healthy eating for my kids, but understanding what your audience is gonna act on is gonna help you with your asks for them. And unless you're from that population or that community that you're working with and helping, if you're not from them, then you need to ask them. and They need to be part of this process. We often think in communications, oh, it's about me. And this sounds good. And I'll, if it sounds good for me, it'll work for them. No. Test it with the audience. Okay. Understanding their values helps you build our message box. We're going into that next. Next slide, please. Oh, and it's really important for you to understand the cultural references and barriers. So we have at Spitfire an entire program now on cultural and creative strategies because we listen to music and see movies more than we do in terms of civic engagement. So how do we tie in and what do people care about? And here's an example from Drake University there in Iowa. They thought they were really cool. This is the time when, you know, you talk about plus ones or Google plus or Disney Plus right now, or Apple TV Plus, and all these plus, 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 plus. And so they're like, hey, we're Drake University. All right, students, we're going to have this big campaign. They worked with a marketing firm, new logo, all of that. When you come here, it's more than just, you know, studies and academics. It's also, we have fun, we've got sports, we do all these things. It's really Drake Plus that's there. So their logo is D Plus. They sent it out there and it Tanked. What is the problem? You can drop it in the chat. What what did they get completely wrong? You probably know. Olivia, anybody? Any things in the chat? Or you can answer it too. None so far. Okay. Um, well, it's a Here's deep the problem. failing. So the deep plus. Right. <laughs> it's totally. They did not test their communications with their audience. Their audience are students and prospective students. How many people want to get, if I'm thinking about college in the mail, I want to get a D plus. No, it turns you off completely. This was a really expensive marketing campaign that they missed the boat on. So Understanding your audience, the cultural references, the barriers, their concerns, their values. What, if you don't know it, go ask them. It's simple as that. All right, let's go on to some messaging. Let's see what this looks like. We call this our message box. And it looks like it could be a box or it could be the logo, whatever, replace Twitter. It could be anything else there. But it has four parts. Because four parts are easy to read. You can use this message box on your family, on your friends, on your funders. Uh, this is a way to organize communications. And uh, you can use it to set up your social media posts or presentations. You want to start with your value message. Appeal to their value. Where does their value intersect with what you want to do? Find that space in the middle, that little Venn diagram there. So if they care about saving money and time, hey, cookout, open, you know, almost 12 hours a day, we're there for you and your family with something that costs a little bit, is quick, and is nutritious because we put real bananas in the milkshake sold. Uh, but there's a barrier. So next build, you want to have a barrier message. And this is not repeating the barrier. This is overcoming their barrier. So as much as you knew your, know your audience, why are they not acting? What do they think about your program? 
What do they think about what you're asking them to do? Why are they not doing it? So this is how you overcome it. And once you have that overcome, and I'll give an example uh, next after this. Uh, then there's the ask. One simple ask. What's something that's measurable, an action you can see that they do? You send this message and you say, learn more. Learn more about our program. That doesn't mean anything. Are you going to quiz them to know if they've learned and read your mission and vision? No. Ask them to show up to a meeting. Ask them to sign up for a newsletter. Ask them to donate money. Ask them to be a part of this course or class that you're providing. Ask something clear. And don't ask four things. Ask one thing. Because we hate when we have our to-do lists and all the things. And if they do that ask, then you get that vision statement. And it's got to tie to the value that you had there. What do they get if they're a part of your program? How is their life better? How is their community better? Tied to the value that they initially cared about. So that's our message box. Let's see it in action. This is one that we did for the Innocence Project. And this was trying to convince two senators on the Senate Judiciary Committee to we want them to provide DNA testing to all accused of a capital crime. This was passed. But these two senators were Republican senators who were Catholic. They were very pro-life. They were anti-death penalty. They believed in fairness and justice. That was their value. And we spoke to their value. We said innocent people should not be wrongly convicted and sentenced to die. The barrier that they said, it doesn't happen. We've got the best justice system in the world. Pause for smirking and laughing and guffawing there. But they said, instead of saying, you might think we are the best, no, no, they said more than 100 have been wrongly convicted and sentenced to die since 1976. Whoa, we've got the stats. You can have bullet points underneath there. We want you to vote, to provide DNA testing on this, and then we'll have a more fair justice system. Very simple. It worked. They do this now. Next slide, let's bring it down from Senate Judiciary committee to a client that we, oh, before we do that, let's talk about some messaging do's and do nots. One in your message, there's five there. Number one, no acronyms, no jargon. This is, this is, and you, me go, we say my eyes glaze over. Next slide. We worked with a, uh, a, a biologist who said, I've got a campaign to protect charismatic megafauna. And we said, what is that? Sounds like some band from Brooklyn. No, what is it? Next slide. It's big, cute mammals that have popular appeal. Say, I'm working to protect bears and sloths and just say what you mean. Don't hide behind fancy scientific or jargony words. It's not gonna connect. Don't say words like opportunity youth. Do the youth call themselves opportunity youth? That is a foundation or a funder created term for kids who the education system is not working for them. There's not a good fit. We can find other ways to get them back into a path or onto um, some better jobs. All right, next slide. Incomprehensible data. Remember when we all had those infographic sheets that look like this. Next slide. All of those numbers, again, there are a few people that numbers will move them. The rest of us, it's through stories. We'll talk about that. So do social math. What we mean by that, take one number that is really important for your issue. Not four, not three, one number that's key that will move people and put it in context of their lives. Is $37,000 a lot or a little bit? How can we take a certain number or two million? So here's what uh, the Justice Policy Group did in, um, in Baltimore. So they said the cost to incarcerate one person from Baltimore is $37,000 a year. That could buy a month of housing for 30 families. Let's think about where we're putting our money and where it should go. This does not mean cutting back on the food and, and provisions for the person in the justice system. Let's see about not incarcerating so many people. So you see how they took one number, which could be confusing, 
and put it into something that, oh yeah, we can do this. It's called social math. Next slide. Public health syndrome. We want you to be clear. Bless their hearts. I've worked with public health. Some of my best friends work in public health. I love their mission. And the messaging often goes wrong because this is what we get. Next slide. Okay, this would be a quiz time. I would ask you to translate this into English. But I'm simply going to ask Olivia to go to the next slide. Kids with health coverage do better. Go back. Just one real quick. Evidence indicates that adjusting for variation in family income, children with health coverage have better outcomes, standard than do without. Listen, and then forward one more. You can be bold. You can be clear in your messaging. You're not lying. You're not exaggerating. That's all you need to say. You don't need that other stuff in your messaging. Pare it down to what's most important. Next slide. We don't, as noted before, want to reinforce stereotypes or deficit-based tropes. Bless their hearts at this next group. They thought they were doing well, but they were reinforcing, they were trying to change something, but when you bring it up, it sticks in people's minds. Next slide is a video, and we'll see. We'll give this one a shot. They just reinforced really harmful stereotypes that you have to overcome. Just start with, hey, I'm going to Harvard. Hey, I'm doing this. Hey, I am a teacher. I've been for all of my life. And I'm in public housing. Public housing is a key step to getting people moving forward and a safe, stable place. You can simply go with that. Um, next slide. This is all something that we do and probably the most important thing to be wary of in messaging, don't repeat the barrier. Because when you repeat the barrier, you have to overcome that barrier. We don't wanna say it, we find ways of overcoming it. Next slide, please. This is a group we worked with, they had this on their website. Myth, fact. Myth, SNAP creates a dependency. Fact, receiving benefits from Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly food stamps, Hardly enables anyone to live well. The average benefit equates to roughly 140 a day for blah, 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 blah. What are you going to remember? The barrier. It's also in red. I also gave half of the real estate, the visual real estate, to my competition, to my enemy. Don't do that. Do this on the next slide. Just go here. SNAP improves the health of infants and children. Simple as that. Birth weight, nutrition intake, 
and excellent health stats all go up. Developmental risk, anemia, hospitalization all go down. Boom. That's all you need to say. And there are other ways when dealing with opposition messaging that we have, different tools for that, for mis and disinformation. But basic messaging 101, don't repeat the barrier. All right, next slide. And who is the messenger? Now that you have the message, who has the trust of that audience? We can do the build. It might be a celebrity. It might be someone else that people are paying attention to. Olivia, next build there. Whether we're talking, uh, and back one, there we go. Even Prince uh, on that. That's the earliest uh, video of Prince. He was there at a teacher strike in Minneapolis and he was being interviewed. Who knew? Amazing. All right. Think about your messengers for that. Who does your audience trust the most? Next slide, please. All right, let's put it all together in a smart chart. How we went through something like this, we're talking about goodwill right here. This is someone we worked with in the Washington, D.C. area. Their objective, by this was their smart objective, by January 2017, we would increase donations, our sales in our store, by 25%. We said, ah, it's not quite smart. Next slide, please. We said, who is the priority audience? Who do you want to engage? Everybody? We ask them, who shops there the most? Where do you see the most growth? Who are the most loyal shoppers or possibility of growth? And they looked through their numbers. We worked with them and we came up with this. Next slide. Everyone who shops. And we're like, no, that's everybody. Narrow, focus, go further. Next slide. Mothers of young children, age 20 to 40, on a budget with very little time. Understanding that allowed us to do a little bit of focus groups, a little asking to understand some values and build the messaging and an entire campaign out of this. Next slide. So, the smart chart, the values, speaking to them. And this was on their social media. This is in their uh, newsletter. This is in their advertising. You want to look good for less money. Now, before you build it, don't go yet. What are the barriers of shopping at Goodwill? What's the perception that we need to overcome? You can drop it in the chat. What are the, the misconceptions? Anything showing up, Olivia? Not yet, but I'm sure there will be a few rolling in. Okay. Because y'all are active. We want to keep you engaged on the just, yeah, the clothes are not quality there. Any of that. They're used, right? So here's how we overcome that barrier. Let's do the build. Goodwill features quality vintage and contemporary fashions. Did I say used clothing? No. I said quality vintage, nice word for old, and contemporary fashions. Fashions, when you start shifting its clothing to actual fashions, I want to look good for less money. There might be something there. Next build, so what's the ask? Come shop at a, at a retail store. And then here's the vision. If I shop there, what will I get? Next build. I'll look great without breaking the bank. It's as simple as that. So we're not done yet. You put this all together, you have your message framework, and then you invite moms to a fashion show. You have a red carpet, and you have moms there modeling the clothing, putting together fits, having childcare, having some nice pink bubbly special beverage, and you're putting out uh, fits on Instagram every week, like here's our outfit of the week, and showing that these are quality vintage and contemporary fashions. And they saw a fantastic increase of, and they, we said 17%, it was something like 28% that was there because of that. So their tactics were all influenced by the messaging. We wanna 
treat moms well. Get something, you know, this is, let's get a new wardrobe. Let's go out and let's be fashionable and not mom jeans. Here's where you can do it. And it worked. So you can do this too. Next slide. Once you have your messaging, all of your audiences defined, your decision maker, know where you stand. Now we put it together and this is where most communication plans start. All right, what do we need to do? Next slide. All right, what are the tactics? Meetings, websites, street theater, social media, videos, earned media, press releases, storytelling events, any of these things. These are all things, instead of viewing this as a checklist, which does your audience best respond to? Next slide. Understanding that you don't have to just do one, but be creative, be accessible in there. How are we engaging people's hearts and minds through these tactics? You have the messaging that's there. Next slide. Same message. We have a news story right there about how do we stop the Keystone XL pipeline project? What is it? We get it out in the news. We have art and protests on the ground that show up, and we do direct appeals to the president to do this. Same message, but different tactics. And you need to know which one works best. Meet the audience where they're at, and that will help you. All right, once you've figured out your tactics, now you've got to do it. Next slide. And that's where you go to, when do we do it? When you're ready or when your audience is ready to hear? So how often are people who are in communities thinking about black mothers in jail? You know, the time that they will be thinking about mothers is Mother's Day. So the Black Mamas Bailout Program, National Bailout, would put this out every Mother's Day because that's the one time when people are starting to think about mothers. And there are some mothers who can't be with their families. Let's get them out and let's bring them together. So think about timing when it works best for your audience. Not necessarily, hey, we got this report. We're done. Get it out there. Woo. Maybe not. Next slide. And who's going to do it on your team? Do you have enough time, budget, all of these things? And what is it going to take? Next slide. How much will it cost? Not just money, but time. All the time that it's going to take. Who's going to be on there? How can we bring outside uh, support? So these are the type of questions. They're all in the smart chart. You build this together. And then if you do this on the website, it pumps out a comms plan for you. Last thing we want you to do is your measurements. Understand how you're evaluating it. Next slide, please. And next slide, we'll go to that. So again, let's say you're putting out a newsletter, right? That's we want to increase the open rate for the newsletter. First build here. So we've increased it from 30% to 94%. Woo, awesome. But what does that mean? That's not enough. Nobody can rest communication, uh, their laurels or their work on, hey, we got more people following us. We got more people opening our newsletter. That's the vanity measurements. It needs to lead to action. And next build, we want to see more volunteers and supporters and members of our group. Or next build, we want to see more donations. That should equate with that. And if your outreach, newsletter, meetings, tactics, anything there, even messaging, is not getting those results, we need to go back and change those. So this is what the smart chart helps you do. All right. Let's take a quick breather here. Uh, I, if, they have, if there's any questions that we have, um, I just wanted to say the smart chart has been used by thousands upon thousands of nonprofits. Uh, it's free. It's out there. It's for you to use and make your communication smarter and more powerful. 
Now, we communicate and you have these plans, but you need to talk about it. You can talk about it with messaging, but you should also talk about it with stories because that's what we're programmed to listen to. We're not programmed to listen to fact sheets. We're programmed to listen to stories. And that's what we're going to talk about next. There are some questions here that I want to know how many of you use storytelling already. And are they ethical stories? Olivia, do you want to drop in the, the poll question? And I'll let Awesome. There's another question on there. Thank you all for doing this. Do you use consent forms? Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. All right, that was a little quiz time right there. Let's go back to the thank you for all doing that. Let's get back to the main goal here. Oh, all right. So I'm going to start with a story here, obviously, with that. Um, I want to tell you about when I started at, I left the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's national program office called uh, healthy Kids, Healthy Communities, and I was the head of uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shields Foundation's communication program, or communications. And um, on my first day there, I went in, met all the staff who I'd met before, but I said, I want to hear a story of one of your grantees. And they've been around for over 10 years. They've given millions of dollars. Tell me about a, a story. And they looked, I'm like, oh, I said, you do community gardens in every county in North Carolina. 100 counties, a lot of gardens. Is there a story of one? They're like, oh, yes. Oh, I got to tell you about Pitt County. This is in Greenville, right between Greenville and Winterville. Alice Keene Gardens that are there and um, started in 2011. 300 kids participated in the program there. It grows a lot of vegetables, like almost more than half a pound per square foot per season. And the kids, they take courses in cooking and gardening and nutrition. It's so cool. They love it. And I said, that's awesome. That's not a story. And so I said, I'm just going to go out there. And if you love it so much, I'm going to go out and interview the um, garden manager who runs these programs. And her name was Joni. And so I went to the garden. I said, hey, I'm from Blue Cross. Love to take some photos. I've heard great things about your garden. Can you tell me a story or something about the garden and the impact? And she was like, yeah, we started in 2011. 300 kids participated in it last year. We have, um, you know, tons of vegetables that come out. And the kids, they take courses. And, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's not a story. Please, that's a grant report. And so this is going to be important for you here. There's times when you can give this information. But the way we connect people is with a story. So I said, Joni, did this change anybody's life? And she said, oh, let me tell you about Michelle. Michelle came on the first day that we opened. She was there waiting to get into the garden. She was bouncing up and down. She couldn't wait. I unlocked the gates. We started it. And she just ran through the garden, up and down. You can see the rows down there. Up, left, back. She was looking for something. And she came back after a few minutes out of breath. And she said, Miss Joni, Miss Joni. I, this, I love it. I'm so excited to be here. But can you tell me where they grow the ribs? And Joni was like, okay, you, we, the food system we've got. And she said, ribs? She said, baby back ribs. I love them. I, that's my favorite thing. Where do they grow them in the garden? And Joni's like, ah, okay. Ribs come from cows. We don't have that, but we do grow pizza here. Shayla's eyes lit up. She said, pizza for real? She said, look, over here's the basil. We've got garlic over here. We've got tomatoes growing right here. 
And at the end of the summer, they were going to make a big dish. It was going to be pizza. But Michelle had been watching Ratatouille. If you remember that Disney sh cartoon where, you know, a rat cooks, um, the main course there, if you remember, was Ratatouille. And so they decided to make Ratatouille that year. And it was so good. And Michelle was so proud of it. And when they served it for their parents, she asked her mom to make it every week. And it was so exciting there that we created a story, this, the rib garden story. We put it on our website. We asked Michelle's moms for permission to tell the story and include their recipe. And the next year, Michelle came with about eight of her friends to work in that garden over the summer and be a part of the program. So we call that the rib garden story. That's something that our board members can tell, our staff can tell. It's on our website. It was something that allowed people to understand what we're doing. So that's different from a grant report. Next slide, please. Why stories? We're gonna talk about power of stories right now, strategic storytelling, the kind of stories we can tell, the toolbox, ethical storytelling and catching, and where you can find additional resources. So, next slide, why stories? What do you need stories to do for you? Question for that. Demonstrate impact, get funding, change people's minds, hearts, policy. How are you using stories? I think I saw 79% of you are using stories. What are they doing for you? You can put it in the chat if you want, but let's keep going. Why do we have stories? Again, we are encoded to tell stories. Our ancestors, thousands of years ago, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thousands of years ago, looked up at the sky. We tell stories to make sense of the world. And I want you to take this seriously here. Again, our ancestors looked up and saw all these data points, points of light up there. What did they do? In every community around the world, they connected the dots. Next build, and they created constellations. And these were to tell stories about their society. They made sense of the world, of things they did not know. Next slide. So as ancestors told that about the sky and about the world and understanding, your role and responsibility, I would even say, is to tell stories about your community, about your issue, about what you're doing. Because we hear things that happen on social media, in the news, whether it's something horrible or whether it's something wonderful. Your job is to make sense of the world there for the community. You're creating the constellations that are there and showing the heart and the resilience of the people that you serve. So you use these to connect people and make sense of that world. Next build. We use stories to capture emotions and enjoy people's joy or pain to bring them along. Next slide. We use stories to build credibility. Again, we've worked with the Innocence Project and they can say, talk about the hundreds of people that they've had exonerated, uh, released from jail, uh, for false accusations, but they can tell the story of Richard Jordan there and how he was imprisoned for over 25 years for something he did not commit and how he's finding a new life. That's building credibility and what they did to get him out. Next slide, please. Great change. How many of you saw Blackfish, a documentary that's out? This is a documentary about SeaWorld and how the animals were abused there. Well, guess what? It caught a lot of attention, a lot of people, and actually fewer people started going to SeaWorld. And because of that, they had to lay off much of their staff. And because of that, they said, maybe we need to change our mission. And they did. And they're no longer having these beautiful, majestic creatures do tricks for people. They're actually have an environmental mission to restore them to health and protect our oceans. And so that would not have happened without the documentary. 
Maybe it'll happen with Tiger King. I don't know. We all watched that because that's what was on when the COVID lockdown happened. All right, next slide. Key thing about stories, too, is making the invisible visible. How do we lift up something which has been plaguing women and many industries for decades, hundreds of years? And, and Tara Burke, uh, the one who had the story there first, talked about Me Too, and it was amplified by others. But this is something that maybe a few people knew. And by this time, everybody knew. Next slide, please. These are people's stories. Stories bring us together. From the fires that we sat around and shared stories of our culture to, next build, the Kindle fire. Sorry for that, but Listen, where do we spend so much of our time on our phones, reading stories, whether Instagram, whether TikTok, whether it's on Amazon Prime or Disney Plus? We center our entertainment around stories, our attention. So what are you doing for those stories? Next slide. We use them to demonstrate impact. I was working on decreasing BMI. Next build. Policy being passed. Told stories of that. Next slide, money being raised. We do all these things. Next slide, A1Cs improved. These are stories I was telling at uh, Blue Cross. We had to have stories to demonstrate impact. But you know the most impactful? It's someone's words, changing lives. And you can read that. One sentence, that's a story in itself. Next slide, please. Stories are powerful. But understand that stories have been told about other people and have marked other people in that way, defined other people. There's a proverb that said, uh, the history of lions has always been written by the lion hunter it would be very different if it was written by the lions. So understanding the need for ethical and responsible storytelling. Next slide, please. So what do we mean by strategic storytelling? Next slide, please. We can tell a lot of stories, but they're not Story is not a collection of bullet points. 300 kids going through cooking, gardening, these. They're not a new story. New stories are wonderful that we tell them and we read new stories and we hear those. But what needs to happen in the first paragraph of a new story? Who, what, where, when, why? And you've heard the phrase, don't bury the lead. All of that so you don't have to read further. You want to engage people. You want to bring them into your world. You want to make sense of what's going on and care about you, your organization, the people you serve. If you tell everything in that first paragraph, it's just news. You also need to get beyond the one trick pony story. That's the same story you've been telling for the last 10 years. We need to refresh our stories. You do not need 30 stories. You need three stories, three good stories per year about what you're doing and refresh them the next year. Again, this is a key thing. This is what I did because even though I was comms director at this foundation, woo, so cool. I was also comms intern, comms copywriter, comms graphic designer, comms, you name it. I was one person and many of you have one person or half a person that's doing communications. You can't do 30 stories, just choose Three, and I'll show you how I solved that in a bit. Next slide, please. So they need to be strategic. It needs to have an objective. Why are you telling the story? To get what accomplished. Next slide. You have to understand what are we most important thing about the smart chart? Who is the audience? Not the general public. Who needs to hear this story? Be as specific as possible. And who will they listen to? Next slide. Who is the best messenger? for this 
story. That's what Spitfire brings. That's the strategic elements of stories. Now let's talk about the different types of stories that um, you can tell. Next slide. We say there's six types of stories that you should have ready to go. I'll give you a quick overview and then we'll, we'll go to the story elements. Next slide. The first story, nature of your challenge. This is the story that you tell what is about the problem that you're solving. If you're in a nonprofit, you're there to solve a problem. We, this is how we're built in this country. We have problems that are solved by nonprofits. You were started for a reason, but you're tackling this challenge. What's the story of that challenge? How did it start? This is where you bring in some of those uh, visible or invisible structures that are oppressing or privileging different folks. And you can talk about the systemic racism, any of the issues that are there. This is a story that you use in grant reports. Get it out there. It's good on the website to give people that sort of 101 while you're there. Next slide. The how we got started story. How did we start? What was the organization? How did we get started? Who came up with this idea? Was it just some people were at a conference and said, that's a good idea, and we started? Or was there an incident, a moment, something, how we got started? This is the type of story you have history on your website, but maybe there's a story behind that. It brings people in. This is a good story for everybody in your organization to know. So when you get new employees, how do we get started? Sorry. Everybody loves an origin story, right? Bitten by a radioactive, unaffordable housing spider, or maybe not. Okay, next type of story. Well, that's, here's uh, just an example, the Woods Hole, but we'll go forward on this. I worked with them. Keep going. Next slide. Oh, these are some examples of stories. How we got started. It's all in there, the food trust and that. Okay, here's an important story uh, also to consider, the performance story. This is a story about your organization. I want you to know there's the success stories, but those are about the people you serve. That's their story. This is the story you need to tell about your organization. Why are people there? What is the passion that's in them, that's driving them? What is your secret sauce? that you have. You need to have a story about that, your performance story. So just to separate that from the success stories to these performance stories. Next slide, please. You need to have the, and the performance story, that's also good for uh, grant applications as well, just to let you know where to deploy these. Where we're going story. This is this visionary story. This is a story that you write. You make it up. Many of you have vision statements on your website. You have mission and vision. The vision is all people should be able to have a, a safe and affordable house to live in. Great. We, that, but you did not draw a picture for me. And these are the stories that your board chair tells, your executive director tells. These are the stories you tell to the Chamber of Commerce, or to a community meeting. They don't wanna hear the challenge stories, nature of the challenge. We know those. We see them in our headlines, we drive past them, we live within these challenges. We want a solution. And so what I'd love for you to do is tell the story of 10 years from now in your community. If you get every grant that you need, if you get every policy passed, if everybody takes part in your programs, what does your community look like? What does your community feel like at that? That's the story you need to tell. And that's the one that inspires and gets people on board. That's the one where you're sharing not just information, but you're sharing inspiration because you're there to solve and you're there to bring that future. And you adjust it. So that's the vision story, where we're going. Next one. Now the emblematic success. Hey, everybody recycles. This is great. They recycle. You recycle. All these things. That's the stories from the community that you allow community members to speak and share their story when they want to, 
when it's appropriate. That's the success stories. You should not be taking credit for their success. They're the ones who went to your program. You helped, but they're the ones who did it. Again, we're not taking agency from these individuals. They're the ones that have achieved these things. And lift them up and celebrate them. Next slide, please. This comes from WePower in, uh, in St. Louis, and they have uh, the training academy for community organizers, residents that are there, and they collect stories and allow people to tell their stories. It's fantastic. Next slide, or next thing. And so you hear in their voices what they did in their life. And so very powerful example, and again, it's Alicia's story that she's telling. All right, next slide. And then there's finally the striving to improve story. This is an internal story. This is a story from leadership. This is a story for staff. When did we make a mistake as an organization? When did I as a leader make a mistake? What have I learned? What are we doing differently now? So it's how we talk about how our organization grows and improves. Where we messed up, it's important to have those stories too. All right, those are the six types of stories. You don't have to have all six. I recommend three of them, but it is key. Next, storyteller's toolbox. Here are the elements of a story which make a story good. Next slide. Let's start with the protagonist, the hero, the character. We know from studies that are done on people watching TV shows and movies that we look at people's faces. They track people's eyes and we go eyes to eyes. We want to see ourselves. We want to see the human that's there. So when you tell the story of someone, give the details, fill them out as much as possible. And remember what we talked about in asset framing? Lift up their dreams and aspirations. I could say that a Pakistani girl really wanted to go to school, believed in school, and kept trying. Uh, she was 14 years old, and some people who didn't believe in women or women being educated shot her. Okay, it's horrible tragedy. But I could say Malala was a girl who'd always dreamed about going to school. That's something that her parents were teachers, that she grew up in a village where they had education for a little bit, and then it was taken away. And she saw the power of it, and she dreamed. And so she would work with all of her friends, come together and go to school, and all these things. So when you tell the story, the most important thing you want to do is talk about the main character. What are their dreams? What do they want to do? Tell us their motivations. All of these things. Because you can't just, hey, I went to school, graduated, everything's good. That's fine. That's a news report. That's a grant report. What a story is when the character wants to do something and they can't. Next slide. Because there's conflict. Something gets in the way. And it could be a police force. It could be a policy. It could be structural racism. It could be something else that's happened. Pandemic. A health issue. What is stopping this person from getting what they want? Again, this is the recipe for stories. Someone wants to do something, they go, conflict happens, they overcome the conflict. They overcome the conflict again. Next slide. This is the plot where they want to get back to the Emerald City. And once they're there, recognize there's no place like home. And they meet various people along the way to get there but they have this level of resolution. Next slide, please. We'd say, you know, at the end, this is from Casablanca. Well, let's, let's modernize this a little bit more. Next build. At the end, you know, there's not enough room for him on the board and her heart will go on. I could put a poll here. How many of you think there was enough room on that piece of wood for Jack? Of course there was. But the resolution, the end of the story, he goes down with the ship. All right, next slide. You have the resolution. You've got the, the, the hero's gone that, but you need more details. You need to show, not just tell. So 
you don't want to include every detail, every star in the sky there as you're telling the story, just the most important ones. Next build. What do we mean by that? This is Starry Night by Vincent Van Gogh. He didn't paint every star that's there. This is transfixing because, and so popular, there's just a few stars, a few trees, a few buildings. That's what's key. The key details that need to be in there and describe them with flourish, not everything. Next slide. You need to have a call to action at the end. I'm telling you the story because you need to do what? Volunteer, sign up, go to our program, donate, join us, all of these things. You just don't want to say, hey, that's a nice story. Oh, that's nice that they did that. They're better now. No. We're telling stories to move people to action. Next slide, please. And please be aware of the broken person trope. So many nonprofits, so many white-led, predominantly white institutions or white-led nonprofits have the savior complex, which comes through as like, hey, this person was homeless, drug addicted, uh, they were unemployed, and they went through our programs, and now they own a company, and they've hired so many people. Thanks to us, we did this. <clears throat> That's the broken person trope otherwise known as poverty porn. We want to move away from that. Next slide. Have one central point in the story. If you see there's like three different points, you need a story for each point. Next slide. The story structure that we have, there's once upon a time, the beginning, give all the details that you need for this. The person wants to do something. What's in the way? Your organization wanted to solve something, but something happened. How did you overcome that? How did you do that? What is that moment of truth where you decided this is the best way to do this? Or this person decided to go back to school or go through your program or do something and now they're better. What's the so what? I'm telling you the story because we need to have more programs like this across the city, helping new moms providing childcare, any of these things. All right, next slide, please. And here's where the values come in. Person first language, not homeless, not ex-con, not drug addict. They're a person first who's unhoused. There's someone who has addiction issues that has not been able to find employment. Use that asset-based language, which we talked about in the smart chart. Don't reinforce the harmful narratives, which we saw in the messaging and name the problem. Has there been a disinvestment from city officials for 40, 50 years in this community? Was it a red line community that was there? Is there unfair uh, police practices and heavy policing, stop and frisk that was going on? What is the problem? If you don't name the problem, people will say, oh, it's them, it's their problem, the person in the story instead of the structural things that are stopping them from being the best that they want to be. Next slide. So we're going to talk about ethical story telling and catching. How do you find and share stories ethically? Where do you get these stories? Next slide. All right. This is what, how we define ethical storytelling. You need to consider who benefits. Who's harmed by this? Who's part of the story collecting, writing, and sharing? This is a two-way thing. You're doing this together. It's not extractive like fossil fuels. It's reflective like solar. It reflects what's going on within the community. You need to understand the power of stories and where they can cause harm. So this is why we say all stories should be ethical, responsible. And I was so happy to see that you are already, many of you are doing this. Next slide. So key, and you can go through the build here, Olivia. Get written consent, as many of you did. Co-create stories, that's the best way to do that. Understand, ask them. You don't need to add extra drama. This is not a real housewives of nonprofits. Yeah. Leave the drama to that. This is where they're sharing what was important. Ask for feedback, does this reflect your experience? Let them know where it will be used, how long. 
if you're putting their name and information in your newsletter or in your report, then it's going for a small group. If you're throwing it up on your on your Instagram page or uh, Facebook page, are they ready for that attention? Have you protected them? Do they know what to do? And lastly, compensate them. People, you're otherwise extracting stories. Uh, and what you can do is you can provide transportation, you can provide training, you can provide a gift card for uh, dinner, meal out for the family, for groceries, any of the things. You're not paying for the stories. You have to disclose that you're paying for stories, but you're paying for their time, their time with you. And you're appreciating. And if you're taking a photo, have a nice framed photo for them as well. So it's a way that we serve the communities in a more fair and effective manner. Next slide, please. And how do you use your stories then? Majora Carter used her stories at two very powerful TED Talks and got a lot of attention from that. Uh, you can have a storybook that's there, one pagers, website. All your spokespeople tell this. Your board members should tell this. All these ways you can use your stories once you've collected them. Here's what I did. Next slide. I, because it was a team of one, I found the best. There were three main stories, and I had two, three minor stories. And I put them in our annual report. And I worked with a photographer. I had a bit of a budget there. And we went out and we captured photos from it and first build. So I had a story for each of our issue areas that we we're working on. Healthy communities, healthier nonprofits, and access to healthcare. <clears throat> and with that, I included a data point that was relevant, not five or 10, and I included a quote. Next build, for every story that was there. And then I took those stories that I spent a lot of time on and effort, and really good stories, and I use them for the next six months in all these things. Next build. On social media, internal communications, in all presentations, on our website, our leadership was able to tell these stories. I had a different theme for different months uh, where I went deeper in those and took elements of the story out. The point is that you can use them there and keep them for the rest of the month. Many organizations put stories in their, in their annual uh, report and then they leave them there. Keep using these stories. Next slide, please. How do you use stories at work? Build it into that. Okay, next slide. So how about at staff meetings? Have someone share a story of some of the work that they're doing. And every week or every month, a different department or person will share a story and start with a leader sharing their story. Why did they get involved? Make it a part of your culture. Next slide, please. So you have this checklist here. Three stories, staff meetings, story leads, board meetings, onboarding as people come on board, celebrate with stories, do a story slam at your annual uh, retreat. Have them in all your materials and have a story bank. It's the way to go. All right. Now, stories are so powerful. And this is what I truly believe. When your story about the community, about this work, about this issue is so good, it no longer belongs to you. It becomes part of the community. It becomes a narrative. It becomes on, this is why this community is so great. And that's what you want to aspire to do because you're all doing incredible work for an issue that's very close to your heart, for something that's so important. And if you can tell the stories about that and they get out there where people have hope and start sharing the stories on their own, it's no longer yours. If it's bad, yeah, that is a bad story. All right. Thank you all for this. We have resources, smart chart, uh, the Smart Chart website. You have a story planning uh, guide sheet that's there. Uh, all these things, uh, I gave you some additional tools. I'm happy to take any questions uh, if you have them in there, but we also, uh, I know Ebony has some really exciting things to share. I'm open for any questions. Olivia, if you wanna share any. 
Yes, so we are now in the question, the Q&A segment of our webinar. So please use the questions box to keep those questions coming in. This is a group discussion, even though we are not unmuting people at this time. So again, use the questions box, ask Mark any questions that you have. Um, we'll also provide contact information so that you can reach out to him. Um, the main questions that I'm getting right now is will um, we be providing the PowerPoint or the recording? We'll, we will be providing both um, within a week from today. So you will have this to reference as you're going back um, to implement this into your work. Yeah, and PowerPoint will be in PDF, will not be a standard PowerPoint. Yes. And Olivia, I'll make sure you get that. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, I really appreciate this. Mark, you've done an amazing job because all people are asking right now is, will this be shared? Will this be shared? How can I find this? And great ideas. Um, we do have a one question from Kelly Christopher. Um, she, again, she said that you have great ideas and this is a lot of work. So how yes. some suggestions that you can give to a nonprofit that does not have a dedicated marketing person because you did say at one point that sometimes you have half a person to do this I know or sometimes it's everybody's job oh my mm -hmm. gosh Kelly I was there I know this um, so a couple things getting your executive director to understand how to use the smart chart walking them through this using this messaging box messaging tool helps them be more effective it also helps them you, them say no or you say no to them when they're like you know what we need a podcast everybody has a podcast and you go through and you say hey our audience is there they don't listen to podcasts that's not going to be important all those things so it allows you by using the smart chart on a regular basis and getting your executive director on board then they say you know what maybe we need to have more budget for comms maybe a little bit more time the other thing is and this is why I use that annual report. Everybody has to do an annual report. If you focus your stories on that and build up to it, then use that over the next three, six months to share what you've learned. Again, you don't have to have 30 new stories. The more you tell your main three stories over and over, the more your audience associates you with this issue. Instead of, wait, they're doing childcare, they're doing teaching, they're doing health, they're doing this. Talk about the impact on maybe two generations of families that have gone through your programs. And it's more than just all the programs we have to memorize. So again, limited amount of stories, getting leadership on board for understanding the smart chart and using that message box will help go a long way and will keep your communications more manageable. And then you can say like, do we really need? Okay, another quick poll question. Raise your hands if you want another newsletter in your email box. Keep your hands up if you read every newsletter that you get. How many want more email every day and more things to read? So maybe you don't need to do that monthly newsletter. Maybe it needs to be quarterly. Ask your audience. That's the most important thing, and they will guide you the comms that you need. Not your board chair, not your executive director, is they might be a little ego driven. Sorry if you're on this, but I've worked with many. All right, hopefully, Kelly, that answered your question. I think it did. That was a great response. Um, and we had some good responses in the chat as well. We do have another question from Alistair. Um, how should you determine which three stories to focus on? Ah, uh, that's a really, that's a really good question. Um, thanks, Alistair. I, the most, uh, you would want that success story coming from the community, and that's a way to build uh, your relationship with them, that they see that you're trusted, that you're caring and sharing their stories to the people they need to be. So that would be a type. I would have your performance story that's there, good for grant applications, and you can have elements of nature of challenge in it, all of that, but really what is the story of us that's there at the organization? And not enough people do a vision story. 
And I think that's really, really powerful. And we need that good news. We need to envision that amazing future. So that's what I would say are the three, but you might have three really powerful uh, success stories that you can use. I mean, you can also maybe do five, but it's within what is possible for you and what your audience needs to hear. Start with your audience. Okay, and I'm gonna try to squeeze in one, maybe two more questions, but- Okay. And I love this question because it's at, racial equity is at the center of our work here at Prosperity Now, and I'm sure it's near and dear to many people on the call. Um, but we had a question around storytelling and narrative change, but how do you highlight racial equity um, and or even cultural um, considerations in an area that is not very diverse? In the sense that they're not used to hearing that, or this would be a shock to them. Um, I need a little bit more. Yeah, I under I understand, and I don't. I think in a sense that it, they're not used to hearing that that racial equity isn't something that's at the center of a lot of communications in that area. And I, I again, it can be a learning opportunity. It can really help people without shame and blame show sort of the historical and structural things along the way that have impacted a different group that, and, and I'm just gonna give a really quick example. In Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, any new teacher that is brought on board to the uh, Greensboro Public Schools, they have sort of a, a little retreat and they play Monopoly and they allow all the newer black teachers to come in and play Monopoly for half an hour, 45 minutes. And then they bring in the white teachers. And the white teachers usually end up quitting within 10 or 15 minutes because they're like, wait a second, you own everything. I can only pay rent. I, this is really frustrating. And they use that as an opportunity for people who might not want to hear about DEI or racial equity to say like, this is the type of experience that maybe your students are going through and they feel frustrated and why they might want to quit or so mm -hmm. this has been something that's been happening for a while finding a way to help people see the larger structures and the impact that it's had is a way to help uh when you're starting to talk about that okay. and also lean into common values that everybody from that geographical community has and how it might be working for them and might not Next. Okay, thank you. And I think that's all of the questions that we have for today, Mark. Um, again, okay. you've done an amazing job. Most of our questions are just comments and praises Aww. and so much. So, thank you. Um, yeah, we're really, really happy to have you here in front of um, our Prosperity Now community, as well as your cohort, um, to deliver this really I'm... necessary content. Well, Olivia, I'm honored to work with this program and honored to work with these groups uh, across the country. I think uh, this net larger network is something that at Prosperity Now, they can open more doors and more connections and really lift up the incredible work that you're doing to get the attention and funding that it needs. So uh, you're all doing this for a really important reason and you should be getting even more attention and support for this. So thank you all for being there. Hopefully you're going to be telling really powerful stories and really great messages uh, and smart communications. All those are on our website. You can get a copy of the deck. Thank you all for being here. Turn it over to you and yeah. Ebony. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to switch over to Ebony. Let Mark take a break and go off camera and mute for a um, uh, job well done. So I'm going to pass everything over to Ebony our Senior Director of Programs. Thank you. Thank you. I also just want to say thank you, Mark, for the wonderful presentation. I mean, no matter how many times I have said on your presentations, I always feel like I'm learning something new and you're always dropping some type of gem that I'm like, oh, I like that. So thank you again for being with us today. So yes, yeah, so let's wrap some things up. Next slide, please. 
So we have um, so few, a few things that's happening. As I mentioned um, earlier, this is a series of learning opportunities that we want to offer to our nonprofits. And so the next training will be on board management. That will be held September 20th from 10 to noon. We also have an in-person training happening. Um, this will be located in the DMV and um, information on this will be going out by next week maybe by the end of this week, but this is a, a training where we will be really grounding nonprofits around how to actually use data. We have a racial wealth divide profile that if folks can, if someone from my team can drop it in the chat box, that would be wonderful. But we have a racial wealth divide profile that we um, develop that represents the DMV and the, the economic disparities that's happening. And so we will work with nonprofits and other stakeholders who are interested in learning how to utilize the data to better inform their work and to advance the, the good things that they're trying to do. We also want you to complete your survey. We want to know where we can um, do better and what's working for folks. So, so please complete the survey that will be provided at the, at the end of this um, webinar. I also invite you to sign up for one of our networks to stay in the know about the things that we're doing at Prosperity Now. And we do have four networks. And so please sign up for one or all of them. But definitely um, take a, advantage of those networks so that you can know other opportunities that you may want to engage with Prosperity Now. And let us know if you have suggestions for future call topics. We do this for you guys. We are trying to offer some resources, tools, best practices. And so if you have some suggestions, we are definitely open to listening to those. Next slide. Also, plug into our Prosperity Now community. As I mentioned, we do have um, many um, networks. And so definitely take advantage of those. You will see the type of, the type of um, information and topics that we focus on. And so definitely um, connect with those. And then lastly, next slide, please. We invite you to take action with our Prosperity Now campaign. We do have a very robust uh, state and uh, federal policy team that do work around advocacy opportunities as well. And so as you will see here, uh, we do have four federal policy campaigns on home ownership, consumer protections, financial security, and turn it right side up. We actually have a webinar that's going to be taking place on uh, consumers um, protections, and that will um, be happening um, this, Thursday, actually, September 14th at one o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And so if someone also can put a link to that in our chat box, that would be great because that is our next um, training opportunity that we definitely invite you to come and learn and see how you can be an advocate um, around consumer protections. So with that, thank you all for taking time out of your days to be with us today. I hope you found this information instrumental to the work that you are doing. And um, as mentioned, we will definitely make sure you get the slides um, from today's discussion and all the resources that um, Mark referenced today. So thank Thank you again and have a wonderful day.